cool kid. He wouldn't have to shut his phone off and hide his phone when he's on within class like everybody else. Um, and uh, thinking that the teacher wouldn't hear, hear it. And he had a pretty old teacher. Uh, and, and it's true, she didn't hear it when it went off. However, every other student in class heard it and they were just freaking out like, hey, what is that sound? Shut that thing off. And uh, the, the teacher still ended up taking his phone, which is, of course, how I figured it out because I had to go to the principal's office to get his phone back here and, you know, and promise to discipline him and keep his phone and blah, 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 blah. So the... Uh, and the uh, ringtone is, is quite interesting here. And so I'll turn it back on, and like I said, it, it's too bad. I, I'll put it up to the lapel mic, see if you guys can pick anything up. But a combination of my lapel mic, and then recording it, and then sending it to your speaker. I'm not sure how much this is going to uh, pick up. Because another fun one to do is a little bit higher, up around the 16, 16.5. 16 uh, I can still hear it, but this is where the ideas of the people who did the ringtone got their idea. There was a, a small shop in uh, London <coughs> that uh, catered, whatever their product was, catered to older people. Uh, I don't know what they sold, but it was for older people. And out in the parking lot and in the Mesa area, there was a bunch of uh, young 20-something, they would just kind of hang out. And the, the shop owners really felt like it was chasing away their business customer, their 65 and their 70-year-old uh, customers. So they got together and they came up with a very clever idea. They invested in a stereo system and they did this. And they just turned this on. And in a face-to-face -face setting, when I turn that on, everybody who's in their 20s just cringes. It's like, oh my gosh, I can hear that. But if you're in your 60s, you can't hear it at all. And so what ended up happening is it chased away all the uh, young kids who like to hang out. Uh, they said, let's get out of here. That noise is obnoxious. And then brought in, and well, the old people never heard anything. They're like, well, I don't hear anything. It doesn't bother me at all. And so they took advantage of that tone deafness that, that, that comes with age. And I think that's funny. But it's really no different than, I don't know if you've ever had a rodent problem, rats or moles. Uh, you can buy at Home Depot, uh, uh, mosquitoes also, uh, these repellents, uh, these non-toxic uh, repellents, and it's just a little speaker system, and it makes a sound up at the 30,000. So remember, the, the, if you get up at some point, no humans can hear it, but uh, it really bothers mosquitoes at 30,000. And so I know my wife has one she wears on her wrist here, and it just wraps on her wrist, and it puts out 30,000. Of course, we, we don't hear it, but we could be outside on the patio, and the mosquitoes just say, I, get me out of here and they, and they just they just leave it's really obnoxious uh, to them and and uh, uh, I think it's a little lower than that for the ones that chase away mice and uh, rats and moles I think I think they're around 20,000 but uh, uh, most people can't really pick pick that up or it's if you're not close if you're close to it maybe you can uh, pick it up anyways this is a long story of hopefully what I got across to you is this connection what are sound waves and that changing the frequency really gets interpreted by us humans as what is the pitch or what is the tone and we can have this range we can have them much bigger than that now let me also pause and say what I've been showing you and really focusing on have been sound waves in air could this happen underwater can you have sound underwater? And I would say yes, this is exactly the same physics. And so even though I'm going to spend time showing you demonstrations and talking about the sound waves in the air, like my voice, and my voice is really easy, what, what happens is you know my vocal cords move in a pattern, they hit the molecules, which hits the next, hits the next. And if this was a face-to-face -face setting, then those molecules near that student over there would then hit their eardrum. And so the molecules that were already near their eardrum are the ones that hit their eardrum, but they do it in the same pattern as my vocal cords. Or in this case, it would be my lapel mic. My vocal cord would shift, and then it would push that piece of plastic, with, which hit the electronics, and the electronics then eventually get through the whole internet system, and then when you play it back, it's going to send some electronics to a speaker that is near your computer or whatever you're using for your sound device. 
Um, especially if you use it like an iPad or an iPhone over there, it, it, it's a little different than a paper diaphragm. It's a little piece of metal uh, that, that, that the metal actually gets bigger and smaller, contracts with the, the, the electricity on it and uses what we call a piezoelectric effect. But, but as it does that, it pushes then the, the, the molecules. And that eventually then is what pushes on your, your eardrums here. And so you are going to then hear my voice in the same pattern as my vocal cords through a long process of waves hitting each other here. And so that's what I want to emphasize. Uh, could this happen in a solid? Could you have sounds inside an aluminum box? Could you have sounds inside of a rock? And the answer is yes. And so it's really the same physics here. And so let me point out that even though I'm talking about sound waves in air, they could be in any gas, any liquid, or any solid. <laughs> in fact, you might even argue that an earthquake really is nothing more than a bunch of sound waves. Huge sound waves. See, down deep in the earth, a bunch of rocks slide against each other. Uh, more than rock, a whole tectonic plate. Slides against each other, and then that shakes the next molecule, which shakes the next molecule, which shakes the next molecule. And so it started deep underground and maybe even far from my house, but after a while, it gets to my house and it shakes my house and the molecules that my house is sitting on are now shaking. And so we'll call that an earthquake. And so that shaking is these giant sound waves that are in the, in the solid. Now, let me show you something else here about sound waves that's worth seeing. I'll come all the way back to this equipment. Uh, let me turn it on. Let me go back to a really uh, low frequency, one that you can see with your... Did I go? I guess I didn't go all the way to 20,000. I shut it off thinking it was a waste to go to 20,000. Okay, still on. Uh, but I'm not sure you can pick anything up here, but I'll just, just in case, go 15, 16, I think that's where we left off, 17, 18, and 19. And usually about this point when I point it at a classroom, just the students down in the front are going, yeah, yeah, I, 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 you know, I can, I can still hear it. <laughs> Aren't you done yet? <laughs> uh, but the people far away, even though officially can hear to 20, it's, it's, it's really hard for your ears to pick up anything at 20. You got to be really close or it's got to be really loud for you to pick it up. And so I'll point it here and go to 22,000 and say, okay, now, no, this time the students even go, yeah, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't hear anything here. And so there's uh, the idea there. Now, let me go back to what I wanted to show you or started to show you here before I remembered that I had gone all the way up to 20 is if I set this uh, maybe at about 18 hertz or something like that and watch it go uh, back and forth, I want you to see me work with a different knob here. Uh, you've noticed that I kept changing this knob and these buttons for the frequency, but this knob here that is directly above my wire connections, I'm going to turn it down. And while I turn it down, I want you to look at the speaker here. Because if I turn it about halfway, did you see anything different? Well, let me do another halfway. Could you tell, I'm hoping on that video camera, that this paper diaphragm is not moving as much as it was before? Watch, I'll, I'll turn it up. I'll go all the way up. Okay, so now it's moving a lot. And we'll go back down. And now it's moving a little bit. You see, this button here actually controls, I should call it a knob, I guess. This knob controls how much electricity goes into this electromagnet, which then controls how strong the magnet is, which then controls how much this speaker pushes back and forth. And I want you to see when the knob is in the current position, it barely moves the paper diaphragm. But if I turn the knob up, it moves the paper diaphragm a lot. Now, right now, I have it at a frequency of 18, so you can't really hear anything. This is set here so you could see it. But let me go to some value that you can hear. Let me just multiply by 10. Now, how about that? A little obnoxious. 
but I think not too high. Uh, maybe I should go a little lower so I make sure I can pick it up real well on my lapel mic. But I'll point it at the lapel mic and I will adjust this knob. Now I want you to listen. I'm turning it, the knob. I'm turning it. 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 Now I'm turning it slowly, but I am turning it. I'm 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 turning it. Now it won't turn anymore. Could you hear anything different? Uh, I'll, I'll turn the knob back the other way. I'll go a little quicker this time. So I'll turn it the other way. Could you hear anything different? Now let me shut it off so I can talk over it. But I'm hoping what you heard in there is you always heard the same pitch. I always heard the same frequency. You see, this knob here doesn't change the frequency. It's this knob and these that change the frequency. It's then this knob is actually changing what we would have called in the last chapter the amplitude. I am changing how much did the paper diaphragm move forward and back. And I hopefully what you got out of this was how loud or you might call its volume or what you might call its intensity. How loud is that sound? And so the point I'm trying to get across to you is if we take what we learned in the last chapter and apply it here to our sound waves, we'll see that the, the physics of sound waves is pretty easy. All it is is a bunch of atoms colliding into each other. It doesn't matter if this medium is made out of a gas or a liquid or a solid. You start with something shaking and it can shake at any rate. That's its frequency. And if it has to do with sound waves, then we would call that its pitch or its tone. And the second piece of this would be how much it shakes, its amplitude. And if it shakes a lot, we would say it has a big amplitude. And that would get interpreted by our brains as being loud. And so your brains are pretty clever. Your ear is pretty clever in the sense that it really detects two things separately. As the sound waves hit your eardrums, not only does it vibrate at a particular rate, which we call frequency or pitch or tone, but then it can detect how much the eardrum gets hit or moved. We would call that its amplitude and so that would be its loudness. And so your brain is able to register those two factors. The rate at which it goes back and forth and then the amount it goes back and forth. And so we have the pitch and we also have the volume or the intensity. Um, and in fact, you might be a little bit familiar with a common way of measuring sound intensity. It's called the decibel scale. Uh, your author here does a good job of giving you a list here in your book. And so I called up your book at chapter 16 and oh he does a, a, a little bit here about the ear oh and this is actually maybe a good one to pause I forgot it was here but uh, he's got a nice little chart here of the different uh, frequencies and so here is the human range uh, here's the dog range, the cat range, and so this fits what I was saying about the elephant. See how the elephant's really good way down here in the infrared. Um, I was talking also about mosquitoes and other rodents. Here's the mouse. See way up here, a uh, moth. I'll, maybe I'll put the moth and the bat into this category, but the moth in particular like the mosquito. It can hear really, really uh, well uh, up here. 
And so it actually can't hear really well at these uh, low ones. In fact, most of the sounds us humans make are way down here. So moths can't really hear humans. Uh, see them, sure, but can't really hear them. Uh, but what I wanted to get to in this was this chart here that takes a moment and lists the decibel scale. And so here are the different intensity levels listed on a scale called the decibel scale. And the decibel scale is a little confusing. That's why I thought I would point it out because it is a logarithmic scale. And some of you know what I mean when I say logarithmic because you've done your logarithms, but I have a suspicion there's quite a few of you out there who aren't that familiar with our logarithms, you, and or at least maybe you were acquainted with them, but, but here's what I, what I mean by that. We like to label then sound in, in this category. If, if something has, I'll just put a 10 versus a 100 versus a 1,000 uh, versus 10,000, sometimes it's nicer to build a scale that doesn't really give you the number of how loud it is, its intensity, its volume, that is its power, how many watts are coming towards you, but instead how many zeros there are. So this would be a one, this would be a two, this would be a three, uh, this would be a, uh, a four. Now there's a little more math here than I'm going to take time to do in the decibel scale. But here's what I want you to uh, get out of this. Maybe I'll do one more. Five. The decibel scale is a logarithmic scale. By the way, so is the Richter scale on, the, uh, on earthquakes. And so if you have an earthquake of a four, those are ones that to me, it's like, mm, don't even talk to me about it. You know, that's, yeah, yeah. Did I feel it? No. Do I care about it? No. Did it break anything? No. But what about a 4 to a 5? Whoa. Now your first reaction might be, well, certainly a 5 is bigger than a 4, but that's only 25% bigger, right? No. These are the numbers that indicate how many zeros there are. That's what a logarithm is. A logarithm is telling me how many zeros you have. So when you increase from a 4 to a 5, you are 10 times more shaking. And so that's why, was there a 5? Oh yeah, did you feel it? Oh yeah, did something break? Yeah, a few things fell off the shelf. Uh, better check your gas meter, better check some other things, better put it on the news. We, we want to talk about this. This is not just a little increase, this is a huge increase. And so our human ears are really quite clever because, like I said, they detect not only frequency but also the amplitude. Frequency we call the pitch or the tone and amplitude we call the volume. And so our ears are, <coughs> excuse me, really uh, good at uh, that. And in fact, they are so good that they can record such a huge range in intensity that we as humans have decided to develop a scale that talks about how big they are by listing the number of zeros, not by actual number. So instead of having a number that goes from 10 to a, and your, your ears can go up to a trillion, and a trillion is 12 zeros. Now above a trillion we consider that really bad for your ears. Uh, I, I'm not going to say you couldn't hear it because you would hear it but it would also damage your ear. Your eardrum would be shaking so much that if you were there for uh, too long I'm going to say 30 seconds, I think is how they rate it, but, but this loud trillion for 30 seconds eventually starts rupturing parts of your ear and all of a sudden blood's dripping out. So it, it's damaging to your, your ear. Uh, so you'll feel that pain. Uh, we often then call this the threshold of pain. This is the place where you should really go, whoa, 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 way too much. So like I said, the human ear is, is, is so clever in its design that 
you don't want to list a number. In fact, maybe I'll go to one, which would be no zeros. And so instead of having a small number of one to a trillion, we've decided to list them as the number of zeros, which would be zero to twelve. But then for whatever reason, and I think I know why, they thought that was too small, they decided to multiply it by ten. And so because of that, this is what we call the decibel scale. This is how we measure the intensity of sound. We, we don't actually measure the watts per square meter. That's what this would be. And we don't really just count the zeros. That's what this would be. It's a combination of the two. We take the number of zeros for the intensity of the sound and then take the log of it. Then we multiply it by 10 and we get what we'll call a decibel scale. So know this if you're not familiar with the math of logarithms. I'm not even going to bother to put it on the, on the board. We will do that next semester or I guess that's in physics 123. So in 123 we'll, we'll talk more about this. But this then is our decibel scale. And so we like to say that humans are designed to hear something as low as one watt. If it's less than that, we don't hear it real well. Um, I shouldn't say watt. That's actually one trillionth of a watt. Those are in units of trillionth of a watt. So uh, I'm trying to do this without putting some numbers on the board here. But I am trying to point out then that this is what we call the decibel scales for a human. 0 to 120. So 120 is considered the part that is the most a human can hear without pain. And the 0 is the lowest that a human ear can hear. Uh, not to say there can't be sounds lower in intensity than that, but it just doesn't move our eardrum enough that our brain registers it. And so that's why I wanted to mention the decibel scale. And your author does a job kind of like that. Uh, he doesn't really get into the numbers, but here it is. Uh, way up here, uh, he lists this at 120 decibels. This is a rock concert or an automobile horn. And he puts the one trillion and he says this is about the sensation of pain. This is, this is the, 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 the loudest uh, you would get. And take some time. I won't go through the whole list. But he goes through this and he kind of lists to give you kind of an idea of what different decibel levels are. And so just like I wanted to go through and give you different frequencies, it's good to have an understanding about good intensities of the sound, volumes of the sound, the, the decibel reading. And so you can see all the way down here at a relative threshold of one, which he calls zero decibels, uh, is the threshold of, of, of hearing. And so humans really hear in this range from the lowest intensity of sound right here, the threshold, all the way up to pain. So it's a huge uh, uh, variation. Uh, in fact, the threshold of hearing, even up to what you would call quiet, is 10,000 times bigger. And so your, your human ear is, is, is really quite creative uh, in the sense that it can hear, you know, a range of about a factor of 10,000 between what you would call quiet and what you would call even as low as you could just hear that little mouse rustling and the leaves across the yard uh, on a cold, cool, quiet night. And of course, your ears can handle some really loud sounds here, like an automobile horn or a, a rock concert. And again, I don't think this will come across nearly as interesting as if everybody uh, is in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, but I did bring a car horn. And so here's an old car horn that we have hooked to the car battery. Uh, we've hooked it uh, to a switch. Here's the little switch. Uh, so this would be like, you know, the steering wheel and I just 
push on the on the steering wheel and so when I push right here it it honks the horn and uh, in a face-to-face -face setting I like to do this very shortly <laughs> because it is loud uh, but to give students an idea of uh, 120 decibels now it's 120 decibels if you're close and so those people in the front row will get a little different effect than those in the back row and the lapel mic, I'm not sure how this will pick up, but I'll honk the horn and the, the last here. So I'll push. One, two, three, push. And that, that's, that's loud. Uh, that's probably enough. And so just a quick little burst. It is really loud and it actually hurts there for a, 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 a second here. And of course, your list here even shows numbers greater uh, than that. Because again, you, you can have volumes uh, greater than that, but you've gone way beyond the, the intensity or the, uh, the uh, threshold of, of pain. And so I, I certainly don't want to set anything up greater than that. Well, I would say that's the first half of the chapter, right? That's kind of the, the basic physics of, of what's going on with these sound waves. But in this process of talking, we also mentioned that they have a speed. Sure. They, they, they must have a, a speed. In fact, you could even maybe even predict roughly their speed if you kind of come back here and say, okay, what's was going on here is that you bump this one, you force it in that direction which bumps the next, which bumps the next. And so if we go back to our chapters 13 and 12 and 11, we learned that the temperature is the motion of these molecules. All we're doing is kind of directing them in a pattern. And so there's a small subtlety here between what is sound and what is temperature. See, temperature is just kind of this random motion. So if I just kind of shake these, you know, they're all moving in a random motion. And then I give them an organized pattern, then I've taken that random one and made it kind of organized. And, and so I often get that question, what, what's the difference between a sound wave and, and then, then, then temperature? And temperature doesn't have a, a pattern to it. That is, that if I put my ear out here, I don't hear temperature. I don't hear it because at any given moment, some molecules are hitting my ears, but some are leaving. And then the next moment, that just keeps changing. And so there's a uniform pressure on my ears. There is not like a clumping of molecules. And so once I make a pattern, I take that direction and I put it in my ears. But here's what I'm getting at, is that the speed of these sounds must be connected to the speed of how these things interact. Which in the case of a gas, it's really just the kinetic motion. And so if we take this room, uh, the roughly the speed would be 343 meters per second. Now that's not exactly the speed of the molecules, but that's kind of a component of it. And so we like to say, okay, so what is the speed of, of sound? Uh, maybe I should put it this way, speed of sound instead of velocity here, because it goes in all directions. So I don't really want to say it's a vector, it's not a velocity. But the speed of sound then, and then here's the, the catch, in air, at, I, I got to pause here, I love my at symbols. There, there's a show common now that email has been around for what, 20, 30 years. But I always find it interesting that we need a symbol for a two letter word. Who came up with a symbol for a two letter? I, I get a long word, like velocity, use the symbol V. I get that, because who wants to spell out seven letters all the time? But two letters? Really? Anyways, so I'm going to use the symbol. All right, so the speed of sound in air at room temperature. And there you go. I don't like to spell out temperature, so I'll just put TEP with a period. This is the speed, again, I'll say it, in the air at room temperature. You change any of those two, you're not going to have that same speed. So be real careful with this phrase. When I say the speed of sound is 343 meters per second, what I mean is room temperature and air. Because I don't want to leave you with the impression that all the sounds, the ones in the water, the ones in the rock, uh, the ones in a cold environment have this speed. In fact, 
a nice little equation that, again, involves some calculus. And so I won't derive it until physics 123. is this. And I should emphasize in air also. That is, if you were to increase the temperature of this room, or decrease it, but I'll go with increase, you increase the temperature, these molecules in this room are going to move a little bit faster. And as a result of that, when you come over and make some sound by forcing them in a particular direction like this, you make that little metal piece go back and forth and you push them in a particular direction. As you push them in that direction, they are going to be going faster if their temperature is higher. And this is how it works out to be. Uh, like I said, we, we've got to go through some calculus here, so I, I will make another promise to you that when you learn your calculus and then you sign up for future classes and we get into physics 123 and it's a combination of squeezing and how much it pushes back, and that's kind of the ideal gas law. Uh, we call this a bulk modulus, but if you push on air, it'll push back and it'll bounce back. This, then, is the formula for the speed. And room temperature is about 22 degrees Celsius. So if I were to take uh, 331 and then 0.61 times 22, I get 3, well, it looks like it's closer to 44. And so this is at 22 degrees Celsius. Let me try 20 degrees Celsius. And so 331 plus 0 0.61 times 20 is 343. Three. Now, the number 343 three, three, three or 344, I don't care which one, I would encourage you to commit that one to memory because you're going to see a question like this on the homework and on tests. They'll come over here and they'll say, hey, the professor picks up the tuning fork. Ah, notice that it has been measured at a frequency of 1024. So if the professor hits it and produces sound, you'll hear a frequency corresponding to 1024. What is the wavelength of it? Well, if you remember last chapter, velocity equals wavelength times frequency. I even did a calculation like this with those, those other tuning forks that were on the box when we were talking about beats in the last one. I could put in then the frequency. Now in this case, it's 1024 hertz. Uh, I think when I did it, on the last uh, lecture, it was 256, it was that, that box one. But this one is 1024, and then I can put in a velocity of 343, or 344, or I noticed your author often just rounds it to 345, just to give a, a round number. Sometimes even rounds it down to 340. So don't be too concerned about this number between 340 and 345, that's just saying, hey, there's variations with room temperature. And not everybody says room temperature is 20 or 21 or 22 or 23. And so there's some variations. But certainly I would not use, say, 200 for the speed of sound. 200 would be a place where it's really cold. But to finish this calculation then, I could now get its wavelength. And remember, a hertz is a per second. And so I'd get units of meters, and so now I have the 343, and I divide it by 1024, and we're looking at a wavelength of about 0.33 meters, which maybe I'll just write it as 33 centimeters, and that would be the answer to that, that question. What is its wavelength? Oh, about 33 centimeters. And so 33 centimeters is 
probably roughly this. And so if I could look at the compression here, the next compression would be here. Then the next compression would be here. And the next compression would be here. 33 centimeters apart. And then they would be hitting my ears. And so that is the wavelength of my sound waves that I'm producing from that, that tuning fork. But what I can't overemphasize enough is notice I'm just grabbing this equation way back, or not way back, but back to chapter 15. And so don't forget that. That's true for any type of waves, although I'm talking about sound waves here uh, for this chapter. Now, we could switch this up a little bit. Let's say that a scientist did a experiment and noticed that in this chamber that they have, and I won't tell you whether this chamber is hot or cold, I'll just tell you there's a chamber, and the chamber has a temperature that's not room temperature, but they measure the speed of sound to be only 300 meters per second. what's the wavelength and the temperature. You see, coming back here and using both of these equations, I'd say, okay, velocity is wavelength times frequency. And the other thing is velocity is 331 meters per second plus 0.61 meters per second for each degree Celsius above zero which, of course, we could also go under zero. Maybe I'll do this one first, because I think this is just a repeat of the last one, but I'll do it since I asked. But this is the neat one here. This is saying, hey, I know that this number in this experiment comes out to be 300. Now, I should emphasize, I, there, there does have to be air in this chamber, because this equation is only valid in air, and that's what I was trying to point out. If this was, was air, I would not have this equation. I would have some other equation. Um, and then we would have to look at the bulk modulus of that. And so we don't do anything with other than air, because that's the common one here. And so this little chamber is, is filled with air, and so I know this equation is valid.